This is our third sermon in our series, The Gospel, The New Ancient Foundations. In July, I introduced the series by saying the gospel is simple. It's the good news that God is salvation, or in a word, uh, Jesus. The gospel is simple, but that can be a little bit misleading, for it's also profoundly uh, mysterious. That means that you cannot comprehend Jesus. But Jesus does comprehend you. So simple, Jesus, and utterly profound, a mystery. In our first sermon, Hell, the imaginary elephant in the room, we saw that there is no such thing as endless conscious torment in Scripture. But there are three concepts in Scripture that we think of as hell, or translate with the word hell. Hell number one, Sheol, Hades, the outer darkness where men weep and gnash their teeth. It's the experience of the absence of God. And hell number two, uh, over there far on the far right, uh, the eternal fire, which is actually the substance of heaven. That is the manifest presence of, of God. And hell number three, Gehenna, uh, which is the judgment. That's the place that hell number one meets hell number two and death is no more. In our second sermon, Creation, Did God Lose Control of Time? We saw that there is actually no such thing as endless chronological time, for Jesus is the beginning and the end of time, and in Jesus, God is filling all of time, all things, with himself. So the days of creation, which are the ages of the world, looks something like this. This timeline surrounded by eternity. Hell number one is on the timeline. It's here in space and time. But hell number two, heaven, that is eternity, is all around the timeline. Above, below, before, after, and at the cross, eternity invaded time. That's hell number three, the judgment. From experience, I know that the father of lies hates this uh, picture. And I'm beginning to understand why. Second Corinthians, St. Paul calls uh, the devil the god of this age. And you see, this picture reveals that this age comes to an end. It's literally baptized in the end. The lake of fire. In Revelation 12, Jesus reveals that the devil was thrown down to earth in a great fury because, quote, he knows that his time is short. See, all the devil lies are dependent upon an illusion that the timeline is all that there is. And so you are your own cause and effect. In other words, you are your own creator and creation. In other words, you are the decisions that you have made in the past and the decisions that you think you're going to make in the future. And so there is no such thing as grace. Because <laughs> grace interrupts the timeline. In other words, the evil one wants to convince you that you're the author of your own story. <laughs> there really is no story because it has no plot. But scripture reveals that God is the author of all things, including you. And Jesus is the plot. So last time, we noticed that we all write ourselves out of God's story, and that's called sin. It's choosing nowhere and nothingness. But God writes us back into his story with his word, which is not a temporal illusion, but eternal reality. And so wonders of wonders, God never lost control of time. And the story of our sin and God's grace is really the greatest story that's ever told. It's the gospel. And Jesus is the plot. So remember we said salvation is creation. And creation is the incarnation of Christ in you. The plot in, in you. Salvation is the incarnation of the plot in you saving you from yourself. That's why we watched The, the Lion King. Simba wrote himself out of his father's story, remember, believing this lie that he had taken his father's life. But Mufasa, his father, appeared to him saying, Simba, 
You have forgotten who you are. You are my son and the one true king. Remember who you are. And that's why Jesus, the word of God, would like walk up to guys like Simon Peter and say, you're Simon, uh, but you will be called Peter. You're Peter, the rock. And then Simon would write himself out of the story and uh, deny Jesus, but Jesus would appear to Simon and write him back in, and that's how God made Peter. And how on this rock he built his house. You're a story that's been written from the foundation of the world. And yet you tend to think that you are your own creation in space and time. But God speaks his word and makes you who it is that you actually are. You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, says God. For, in the words of St. Paul, the chief of sinners, who became the apostle of grace, you are created in Christ Jesus. You are, already happened, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that you would walk in them. So anyway, that was the second sermon. And after the sermon, my daughter, uh, Elizabeth, uh, she said to me in the driveway the day after, she said, uh, Dad, I, I understood what you were saying about hell number one, you know, being on the timeline. And I think I, I got what you were saying about hell number two, about heaven surrounding the timeline. But I kind of lost you at hell number three, the judgment. How is it that eternity enters my timeline, my story, and how is it that my story then relates to everyone else's story? And you see, that's a really great question. How does God's will become my will? And then uh, how is it that my will relates to everyone else's will? I mean, if everyone, if everyone in the parking lot at Target believed that they were the only begotten son of God, the one true king, and there was only one parking space but a whole bunch of cars... How would that not turn into World War III? Right? So it's a great question. So I basically said that's what the rest of this series is about. And then the next morning I reminded her of, of a story that she knew that, that I'll share with you in a few minutes. But, but now I'm, I'm going to attempt an answer that I think is perhaps the greatest of all mysteries. And that is the mystery of the Adam. A-D-O-M. Most people think that Adam was this... Uh, mythical man who had no belly button, who really has nothing to do with any one of us, unless of course you happen to actually believe that he ate an apple thousands of years ago and so we're all going to roast in hell forever and ever and ever without end. I mean, that's what most people think that the Bible says. And yet that's not even remotely close to what the Bible actually says. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, then on the sixth day of creation, Right? We talked about that. God said, let us, us, that's a weird thing to say. God said, let us make man, Adam, literally Adam in the Hebrew, Adam in our image after our likeness. So God created man, ha-adam in the Hebrew, the man, in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So male and female are both the man, ha-adam. Them is the Adam. And by the way, a whole lot of our problem with sexist language and stuff comes from not understanding these verses. But in the next two chapters, translators, they, they really struggle because Genesis begins talking about Ha-Adam as if he's a guy named Adam. And apparently he is. And so we think his story is basically over by the end of chapter 3 when he gets kicked out of the garden. In Genesis chapter 5, verse 1, we, we read this. This is the book. What book? Well, it's in the Pentateuch, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So maybe that. This is the book of the generations, which can be translated descendants or even births, like it is in Young's literal translation. This is the book of the generations of Adam. Literally, in the day, 
God created Adam. And, and then there's a, a comma in the ESV, but it could be a period. We, we really don't know because punctu- there's no punctuation in the ancient Hebrew. So it could be that um, it's modifying the sentence before or the sentence after. But anyway, God made him in the likeness of, of God. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them and named them Adam when they were created. Now, I just think that's kind of a fascinating, intriguing couple of verses It almost sounds like the whole Pentateuch happened in a day, and everybody in it is named Adam. Apparently, English translators think this is impossible, and and I don't know. Um, In fact, in two verses, we read this. So it seems impossible. We read that Adam died. And so after chapter 5, verse 5 of Genesis, they don't normally translate Adam as Adam. And yet, and now this is the astounding part. All right, the the Hebrew word Adam appears 530 more times in the Old Testament, of which only three times is it translated Adam, and 527 times is translated as man or mankind, and a host of other words like body, someone, anyone, human, person, and people. And this is the really crazy thing. The word Adam is always singular. In fact, 140 times it appears with the definite article ha or the, emphasizing the fact that we're talking about the Adam, the one Adam. So even though the text in places seems to be talking about an Adam, so we'll talk about, well, if the Adam dies in the tent or whatever, if it seems, even though it seems to be talking about an Adam or perhaps many Adams, one Adam plus another Adam always equals Adam. The Adam. Not two Adams, but one Adam, the Adam. And, and you see, that really changes the meaning of scriptures like Genesis 9, 9, 6, for instance. Whoever sheds the blood of man, that's how it's translated, but in Hebrew it's ha-adam, the Adam. So whoever sheds the blood of the Adam by the Adam shall his blood be shed, or literally is his blood shed, for God made the Adam in his own image. Well, whoever sheds the blood of the Adam is who? The Adam. So God seems to be saying that when the Adam hurts the Adams, he's obviously just hurting himself. In other words, what you do to your neighbor, you do to yourself. And to the Adam. Every Adam, that is the Adam. So, so you can see, you can take this knowledge as a law. And if you do, everything will die. Or you can receive this knowledge as a description of life, as, as a fact. And everything will will begin to live and set you, and it will set you free. Leviticus 24, 20. Listen, listen to this one. An eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, whatever injury he has given Ha-Adam, the Adam, so it is done in him. Well, of course it is. Because he's the Adam. And now we really can't blame the translators for all this confusion because English really has no equivalent to Adam, and neither does the Greek, and I think that's because we're all far more individualistic, we're into individualism, far more individualistic than, than the Hebrews. So, so Hebrews like Paul, who wrote in Greek, they'd have to find other words for Adam, like the Greek word anthropos, uh, translated man, from which we get our word anthropology, but in a few places like Romans and Corinthians, Paul just uses the Hebrew Adam so that, you know, like maybe all of us Gentiles would get the point. Luke is the only non-Hebrew author in the New Testament, but he spent years with Paul and he's obviously fascinated with Adam. So in his gospel, in his genealogy of Jesus, He refers to Adam at the end of the genealogy. He works his way back and he refers to Adam. He says, Adam, the son of God. And then just a few verses later, he he refers to Jesus as the son of God, which obviously implies that the son of God is the Adam. Adam is the son of God. And check this out. Jesus is also 
the son of Adam. Because Adam in English is man. He's the son of man. So you, the Adam, it's just Bible. So it, you give birth to Jesus. In fact, Jesus even said something like that, if you remember. In Romans 5.14, Paul writes that Adam is a type, tupos in Greek. It means like an imprint, like the imprint of something that's pressed into clay, leaving an empty space in the clay. Adam is an imprint of the one being about to be. Adam is the empty form of, well, you know, who I should be, who I want to be, and who I will be, but I'm not in space and time. 1 Corinthians 15, 21, Paul writes, For as by a man, an anthropos, came death, by a man, an anthropos, has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Then in verse 45, thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a, a living soul, psyche. The last, the ultimate Adam, became a life-giving pneuma, spirit, breath. Now that's one of what I call the Bible verses banned by Bible-believing believers. And that his band is tragically ironic, for that verse is absolutely central to the theology of St. Paul, and it was also absolutely central to the theology of the early church and many of the church fathers. And, and, and this is why we modern American supposedly evangelical Christians really need to ask a question, and that is this. What is an Adam? And how do you make one? For there is, in reality, just one Adam. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, on the sixth day of creation, Yahweh Elohim. Yahweh is I am that I am. Elohim is the plural of El, so it's like a plural of the word God. So we're talking like several persons in one substance, or at least two persons in one substance, maybe three persons in one substance. Yahweh Elohim, the Lord God, formed the Adam of the dust of the Adamah and breathed into his nostrils the breath and neshama of life, and the Adam became a living soul, a nephesh. So Adam is spirit in dust. Adam is neshama which is also ruach, and you can check that out in the Old Testament if you don't believe me, which is also pneuma in the Greek, which is wind, breath, spirit, or ghost. Adam is neshama in the dust of the Adamah, and you know, we're all terrified, aren't we, to give up the ghost, to breathe our last, and turn back into dust. Why? We must not believe that God has the power to like breathe in the dust and make us rise from the dead. For some reason, we think he could not do that again. You see, I think that we are pretty familiar with our dust. This is my bag of dust, experiencing some wear and tear. And science knows all about dust because it's on the timeline. It's part of that string of cause and effect. But what is not dust is called spirit. And it seems that this is somehow the critical component of me. So I am not a person that may or may not have spiritual experiences. I am something more like a spirit that is having a personal experience. I'm a consciousness. And this is utterly mysterious to me and to science. Because whatever consciousness is, it's not dust in space and time. It's not atoms, A-T-O-M-S, but something in Adam that is most truly somehow who I am. If you want to see fear in a quantum physicist's eyes, just mention the words, the measurement problem. The measurement problem is this. An atom only appears in a particular place if you measure it. 
In other words, an atom is spread out all over the place until a conscious observer decides to look at it. So the act of measurement or observation creates the entire universe. What's fascinating to me is that although we've learnt an incredible amount about atoms and their behaviour, our scientific journey has only just begun. Because although we know how a single atom or just a few atoms behave, the way trillions of them come together in concert to create the world around us is still largely a mystery. To give you one dramatic example, the atoms that make up my body are identical to the atoms in the rocks, the trees, the air, even the stars. And yet they come together to create a conscious being who can ask the question, what is an atom? I love that. That's uh, Jim al Kahili. I don't know if you've watched his documentaries. He's a physicist from the University of Surrey in England. And uh, he's waking up to the reality that philosophers and theologians have been wrestling with for thousands of years, and that is that I am not me. Although we think that me, myself, is who I am. You understand? There is an I that observes me. But I, the conscious observer, cannot observe I. For the moment that I observe I, I have become me, a thing in space and time. So you see, me is temporal, and I can't be found in space and time. I is eternal, but it somehow touches space and time. Your me, yourself, is like the record of your I passing through space and time. So if someone says, who are you at a party, what do you do? You tell them about your me, saying, well, I did this, and I did that, I got a degree, and I hope to do this, and I hope to, you tell them about the decisions you hope to make in the future. You tell them about your past, your hopes for the future. That is the story that you think you are writing in space and time. But if they say, well, yeah, but who are you really? I want to know you. Well, then maybe they look you in the eye, the E-Y-E, -E, or the I, and they try to have an encounter with you in the now, because in the words of Mufasa, you are more than what you have become. You're more the so than the story that, that you've been writing. Your I, check this out, is more real than matter. And that's what really freaks out the physicist. There's something more real than matter before the Big Bang, and there's something more real than matter in the depths of us. Your eye is more real than, than matter. And would you like proof of that? Would you like proof of mind over matter? Would you? If you would, just raise your hand. Okay, now look at your hand. There it is. Your hand is made of atoms. A-T-O-M-S. That's, that's matter. You see, you, your consciousness, it was your consciousness just now that controlled the matter. And, and I uh, control matter. The matter that I control is called my body. And the matter that you, your I controls, is called your body. And all of our problems arise when we want to control each other's bodies. And yet we don't want to be controlled by anybody. And yet, check this out, this experience of conflict does reveal the most amazing reality, and that is that I am not the only one that matters. Another way to say that is I am not alone. You understand, if... If you don't will my will, I am obviously not willing you into existence. <laughs> and I'm not alone. And this is why rich and powerful people often feel so alone. 
It's because they can more easily manipulate other people's matter and so convince themselves that they are all that matters, that is, that they are alone, and it's not good for the Adam, A-D-O-M, A-D-A-M, A-D-O-M, to be alone, says Yahweh Elohim on the sixth day of creation and before the fall. There's a lot in that sentence we'll talk about later. But anyway, this, this is, this is Adam. Do you see that? I in me. Adam is spirit in the dust of space and time. That is my body, my psychic body, or as Paul puts it, my psychic cost body, my soul. Me is the thoughts that I've thunk. Uh, me is the feelings that I've felt. Me is the experiences that I have experienced, the record of my spirit in space and time. Uh, Paul also reveals that our body is a temple, and that makes sense. In the inner heart of the temple was the Holy of Holies, which uh, was the judgment of God, throne of God, presence of God, hidden behind a curtain. And this is so cool, but the Holy of Holies was the very presence of eternity. The seventh day in the heart of the temple, because the outer courts represent these ages, according to the book of Hebrews. Adam is eternity in temporality, surrounded by eternity. Why? Well, because in God we live and move and have our being, writes Paul. Adam is an eternal I in a temporal me, and now things really get wild because according to St. Paul, I have two me's. Now, the whole Bible says this in a world of different ways, but I think maybe Paul says it most clearly in Ephesians uh, 4.22. He writes, put off your old self, but in the Greek, it's anthropos. Put off your old man in English. Uh, put off your old Adam in Hebrew. Put off your old Adam and put on the new Adam created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, put off the false, speak the truth. Paul believes that I have a me that I think I, I, I made or I make in space and time. That's on the left side of this picture you see on the screen. And he believes that I have a me that God has made, which is who it is that I am on the right side of the picture. On the left is my old Adam, and on the right is the, the, the new Adam, the old Adam, what I've done in space and time, the new Adam, forever new. In other words, eternal, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand. The false is on the, I don't know if you can read that, sorry, I don't have the necessary skills to do this well, but the false uh, is on the left and the true is on the right, the shadow is on the left, the light is on the right. Paul writes this, you were once darkness, <laughs> that's quite a thought. But now you are light in the Lord. And Jesus said, I'm the light. The left is the psychicos body, uh, the body of sin and death, as Paul calls it. The right is the pneumaticos body, the spiritual body, the body of Christ. The left is empty. The right is full. full. And, and now, not to totally freak you out, but the right corresponds to hell number two, doesn't it? The eternal fire the manifest presence of God, who it is that I am. And the left corresponds to hell number one, Hades Sheol, who it is that I am not. It's the experience of the absence of God, who is reality. And yet, to experience something I have to experience it. So even now in space and time, in the depths of the very worst sinner, there is an I, which is the breath of Yahweh, Elohim. And even if you're the chief of sinners, I bet you have loved something, hoped something, trusted or had faith in something, and that's not simply your decision. That's God's decision in you. So in every Adam there is a holy of holies, which is a garden called Eden, which means delight. And that doesn't mean there wasn't one somewhere in space and time. I don't know, but in you there is. In some 
it may be only the size of like a baby. That is the size that they were when they first became self-conscious and so began to justify themselves. In others, it might be much larger, but those people are probably not very aware of it for they don't consciously choose to love. It's just that they've already surrendered to love and so they love to experience delight. It's just their nature. So do you see it? Hell number one, your old man, is like a womb, pregnant, or about to become pregnant with hell number two, your new man, whom Paul calls the heavenly man. When Christ, the eschatos Adam, was crucified on the tree in the garden, delivered up his spirit, the life-giving spirit, the curtain in the temple ripped from the top to the bottom, holiness, which is the seventh day, which is the judgment of God, which is grace, got out and began filling the outer courts of the temple. So the shape of your sin, the emptiness, then becomes the shape of God's grace in you. And so you lose your particular life or psyche, and then you find your particular life or psyche filled with what? Glory. The curtain ripped, holiness began to fill the whole temple. It got out, and you, that is your eye, your consciousness, got in. You see, my eye, you can see my eye there it's on my left thigh there, under, under hell number one. My eye can reside in the outer courts of the temple that is me, as if it's been kicked out of a garden. And when I do, I am entirely self-conscious, ashamed, anxious, arrogant, driven, and utterly alone. Why? Because I think I am my own creation. And all my decisions are sin. But my eye, my, eye, my consciousness can also reside in the holy of holies. When Paul says put on the new man, he's also saying put on the inner man which means I need to get into Jesus. I need to go into the holy of holies. The holy in me is literally Christ in me. Where I begin to believe in him that I am his beloved son, God's beloved son in whom he is well pleased, even the one true king. And then Romans 8, 28, I delight in the law of God in my inner man and all my decisions are love and he who loves is born of God and knows God because God is love. I don't know why people don't talk about this more, but John tells us in his gospel that Jesus is the only begotten. And then he goes on to tell us that Jesus says to us, we must also be begotten. Begotten of the Spirit. And begotten of Jesus. And begotten of God. That's incredible. And yet, even so, while we still live in these bodies of sin and death, we truly are imprisoned. And so St. Paul writes, who will deliver me from this body of sin and death. You know, my body only feels its own pleasure and its own pain. I think that's what St. Paul is talking about when he usually talks about the flesh. The problem with the flesh isn't that it's physical. I mean, read the descriptions of heaven. It's amazing. The problem with the flesh isn't that it's, it's physical, but that it's so very self-centered. Except for in maybe one or two instances that are actually sacraments we don't have time to speak of right now, but you can read about those in Genesis 2 and 3. But my flesh is self-centered. And so it's like entirely self-conscious. And so it competes, it competes, it's self-centered and self-conscious and competes with a life that's all around me. It literally eats life and poops death. I mean, seriously, does, do you ever find that just surprising? Shocking, once you notice. My flesh is self-centered, self-conscious, and entirely alone. But Jesus had flesh. He took on my flesh and died. 
But when he rose from the dead, he also had flesh. And he will not die. You see, it was a dramatically different kind of flesh. Well, anyway, after the last sermon, my daughter said, I get hell number one, hell number two, but I'm confused about hell number three and how my story relates to everyone else's story. And I reminded her of a vision someone had 23 years ago, a vision that I've shared with some of you more than once because it literally changed my life. I don't know that we'd even be here if it weren't for this. 23 years ago, I was wrestling with the Bible verses banned by Bible-believing believers, and most of all, this one particular verse, 1 Corinthians 15, 22, for as in Adam, in Adam, all die, so also in Christ, the eschatos Adam, will all be made alive. 23 years ago, we had uh, four services, including a service on Saturday night, and after the service, this, this uh, young girl, she must have been about 10 at the time, she came to me a bit traumatized obviously traumatized. You know, when people who really want to have visions have visions, I usually take them with a grain of salt. But when people who don't want to have visions and have never had a vision have a vision, I I pay attention. I think she came to me because she thought I was the only one that might actually believe her. She said, I was in the service tonight and... I saw something, and I was like, well, uh, okay. She said, when people came forward after the sermon for communion, I saw these cutter things. They like swung out of the walls and started cutting people. They would like cut off someone's arm and then maybe cut off another person's leg. They, They cut everyone. And yet they all kept coming, (laughs) hobbling cripples toward the communion table. She was really affected by this. So I remember I said something like, oh my gosh, I'm I'm sorry. Because it just sounded so incredibly violent, right? And yet this world is violent. I said, are you all right? I'm so sorry. And she said, well, well, no, that's the, don't be, don't be sorry. It was actually really cool. It was cool because as these bodies began hobbling around the communion table, they began to bump into each other. And when they bumped into each other, they began to fuse at the point of of the wound, of every wound. So like a man with no left leg would bump into a woman with no right leg and they they would fuse and then they all grew into this giant man that just could not be hurt imperishable, undefiled, not fragile. She saw the eschatos Adam, who it is that we actually are. What she saw is called reality. Ephesians 4 verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, Just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. See, it's just what God said in Genesis chapter 1. Let us make Adam the Adam. She saw this. Now, I don't know how much of that you can can see. Um, If I could have, I would have made more than... 10 or 12 atoms over there on the left, but something, I would have made something more like 8 billion or 20 or 30 billion atoms, but it'd be hard to make out. Um, Currently in space and time, we are the atom. In about 8.2 billion pieces. In eternity, which is reality, we are 8.2 billion persons in one body named Adam. The church of Jesus Christ are those persons who have already surrendered to the judgment of God and so freely submit to the surgery. In other words, we repent. Deal with my psyche, God. It's the word that we preach, which is preaching us. It's the word that does the work. People always want to know, who's, who's active here? What's the active thing? What's doing the work? The, the word does the work. He, he draws people 
to the table, and it's the word that is the knife. He cuts the new man from the old man, liberating each one of us to be who it is that we truly are. And it's the word that binds all things together in a communion called life, many persons, and one substance called love, the very image of Yahweh Elohim. She saw eternal reality. And yet it was manifesting. It was manifesting in the experiences of the people in the room because everybody in the room had come to worship that night. And I know this because I'm one of them. Everyone had come somehow stuck on themselves. Conscious of themselves. Maybe as shame, maybe as pride or anxiety or envy, resentment, fear, unforgiveness, despair. We could go on and on. But all the product of believing a lie. They all came imprisoned in themselves. In other words, alone. The word that was preached didn't cut their physical bodies, but it probably did cut their psychic bodies, their psychic bodies. It cut them to the division of soul, nefesh, and spirit, neshama. And that can be far more painful than any other pain. It cut their old Adam from the new, true, and eternal Adam, revealing the deepest desires of their own souls, their longing for love. And so they humbled themselves, and then they found themselves surprisingly exalted as they bumped into other wounded souls at the table, others who were no longer a threat but now a gift. Others that were no longer a curse, but now the blessing. Others that were no longer others, but the missing parts of themselves. Life was no longer the survival of the fittest, but the sacrifice of the fittest for all and in all and through all. And so they finally freely chose to love and they knew that they were no longer alone. In other words, they were saved. You see, it's not something you just do once in your life at church camp. Although that helps, do that. And it's not just something you do once a week at communion, but something you do every time you love as you've been loved. It's the fulfillment of the law and the basis of all ethics. It's losing your psyche and finding it in the body of love, who is God in flesh. It's not self-consciousness, but Christ-consciousness. And it's not your consciousness of Christ, but the consciousness of Christ in you. We become one spirit, one eye with him, writes Paul. You know my right leg never competes with my left leg? And if someone says to me, hey, Peter, Who runs better, your right leg or your left leg? I look at him like, you're insane. You see, all your insecurity, all your anxiety, all your resentment, you know how you compare yourself with other people all the time. All of that is literally insane. Once you get a good look at the eschatos Adam, once you believe that as in Adam all die, so in Christ will all be made alive, you will know that what you do to the last and the least of these, you also do to the eschatos Adam. And what you do to the eschatos Adam, you also do to yourself. And so the very last thing that you would ever want to do is send anyone to some sort of endless conscious torment. And the very first thing that you would always want to do is forgive all of Adam which would be to liberate all of Adam in order to be Adam and liberate you to be yourself. And even if some of Adam tried to take your life on a tree in a garden, you would freely give your life on that tree in the garden. Why? Well, for the joy that is set before you, which is all of Adam. Just think of it. All pain comes from some sort of division in a body. And all joy is some sort of 
communion in a body, maybe even with another body that becomes one body, a body in which the joy of one is the joy of all, and the joy of all is the joy of one. So you know what? My foot delights when my tongue tastes ice cream. And my tongue delights when my foot decides to go dancing, or does go dancing. We kind of all decide together, actually. But you see, on one side of the communion table, it has a whole lot of pain and despair. But on the other side of the communion table, there will be no pain. And the joy of countless billions of people and the joy of God will belong to you. And one last thing, um, you will not be less of yourself, but you will in fact be more of yourself than you ever thought possible. I need to show you this picture every time we take communion. A chicken leg attached to a living chicken is not less than a chicken leg severed from the chicken and sitting on a dinner plate. The chicken leg on the right is infinitely more than the one on the left. It's alive. God does not want to eat you like you eat chicken. God wants to free you from yourself and put you together as his own body, his body of relentless love and infinite joy. And so on the night that he was betrayed by all of us, all of us, he took bread and broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. Take and eat and do this in remembrance of me, <laughs> of my me. Remem putting the members together, remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this is the covenant. It's a marriage covenant. It's an eternal covenant. Scripture calls it both. It's, it's the covenant in my blood. The life is in the blood. Poured out for the forgiveness of, of sin. Drink of it, all of you, and do it in remembrance of me. Dark cups are wine, light cups are juice. And, and I think he's saying, remember who you are. You are my son and the one true king, the beautiful one. Amen. And so, Lord God, I thank you that according to your will, according to your nature, according to who you are, you chose to descend into the frightened, insecure, proud, anxious, nervous man that I call me. And you did that from the foundation of the world. And you did that from the foundation of me as a, a breath breathed into a bag of dust. And you did that on a cross where I took your life, and yet you gave your life. And you do that every moment that I make a good decision. <laughs> you impute your righteousness to me. And you become me. And I'm yours, and you are mine, and I just... I, ah, what a mystery. <laughs> I thank you that I don't have the ability to comprehend that. But you have the ability to comprehend me and my neighbor. And so no man is my enemy. Darkness is my enemy. Division is my enemy. Lies are my enemy. I am not is the enemy of I am. And so, Lord God, I thank you that I am that I am is truly all that is. And, Lord, we will be many persons and one substance, which is love. 
Yeah, that's quite a story you're telling. <sighs> Thank you that you believe it in us. Amen. And so, uh, what have we learned? <laughs> you're not alone. To think that you are is hell number one. To know that you are not, to really know that is hell number two, which is heaven. To wake from your illusions is the judgment. Waking is painful. To be fully awake is absolute joy. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ will all be made alive. This is the mystery hidden, in the words of Paul, from the ages and for the generations, Christ in you, the hope of glory. You are Adam, and Jesus is Adam, and there's only one Adam. <laughs> and uh, look, if you'd like some help with all of that, um, I, I kind of wrote a book kind of about that. Uh, on the left, God and his sexy body, the story of Adam and his bride, it's all about what we preached on today with the added revelation that human sexuality is a sacramental representation of the communion that is, that is life. Uh, we kind of redid it uh, with a different cover, basically just the same book though, and kind of re-put it out as God and his body, the romance of Adam and his bride for those that would think I was some kind of liberal heretic because the word sexy was in the title of the other book. Um, but uh, you can get both of those if you want on, on Amazon because there's a whole lot more to this. Oh yeah, they're also downstairs. Thank you. Uh, also next week, uh, we'll preach on uh, the fourth thing, the fall, the doctrine of original ignorance. That is how Adam broke into like 8.2 billion pieces. <laughs> And so hopefully you can be back uh, next week. But the point of all this is just what I always say, in the name of Jesus, believe the gospel. Amen.